Good morning and welcome to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. We have one item on the agenda this morning, the proposed safety standard for portable generators. For the discussion, the CPSC staff members are Ms. Janet Beyer, Mechanical Engineer in the Office of Hazard Identification and Reduction, and Ms. Barb Little, an attorney in the Office of the General Counsel. Thank you both for joining us again. We'll start with five minutes if there are any questions per commissioner, and then we'll turn into the decision all itself. I don't have any questions. Commissioner Adler, do you have any questions? I have no questions. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. No questions. Thank you. Commissioner Burkle, any questions? I do not have any questions. Thank you. Commissioner Mohorovic. Okay, with no questions, we can let the staff leave the table. That was a fist bump between Janet and Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll now, <laughs> we'll now move to consideration of the underlying package. Are there any amendments? And actually, I'm going to offer the first amendment, which is a manager's amendment. I'm going to describe it briefly and then ask for a second, and then we can go into a discussion of it. This manager's amendment is intended to collect a combination of additional questions and points that the commissioners wanted to add, including my office, into the rulemaking itself to try to spur some more requests for comments on some key issues. We have circulated the amendment. Is there a second? Second. Having heard a second, we'll now turn to discussion. I have no further comment on the manager's amendment. Commissioner Adler? I have no comments. I've read it and I, I like it. Commissioner Robinson? I would just like to um, thank uh, particularly Commissioner Mohorovic for his and his staff's contribution to this and you, Chairman Kay, for yours and your staff's um, contribution to this. I very much support it. We're always interested in the comments that our stakeholders have and I certainly hope that all of them will very actively participate in the, in the comments and I think it's important that we focus them on things that we're interested in hearing and considering before the final rule and I thank you for working. Um, with your staff and with, uh, with mine to put this together, and I support it. Excellent. Commissioner Burkle, any comments on the manager's amendment? I do not have any comments other than uh, just echoing uh, Commissioner Robinson's comments that I appreciate the work that uh, your office, Commissioner Murrow-Ovick's office, and uh, Rob Commissioner Robinson's office have done on this um, amendment, and I intend to support it. I'm a strong advocate for seeking stakeholder comment. So. I look forward to adding this amendment to the package. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is um, uh, an example of uh, being not, ju not just the spirit but the letter of the compromise. So thank you for your office's openness to, uh, to more contributions, to uh, questions, uh, to have solicited for public comment. And um, I do want to recognize um, an incredible amount of work, long uh, evenings and early mornings among uh, all of the special assistants in coming to compromise language. I plan on supporting it and value the process and your openness to it, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Mohorovic. Having heard no further comments on the manager's amendment, we'll now call the vote. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Robinson? Aye. Commissioner Burkle? Aye. Commissioner Mohorovic? Aye. And I vote aye. The yeas are five, the nays are zero. The manager's amendment has been agreed to. Are there any additional amendments? I do have a, an amendment, Mr. Chairman. Mohorovic, you're recognized three minutes to describe the amendment. Uh, the amendment that I have uh, and has been circulated uh, among uh, the commissioners has to do with something that I brought up at the, at the, uh, at the hearing a couple of weeks ago uh, with um, ex-ante retrospective review. That is the idea that, um, that perhaps this rule would be a good opportunity for us to think on the front end how we might evaluate the rule's effectiveness, what data points we might use to judge this on the front end. Uh, I think the benefit cost analysis provides us ample opportunity to start to look at ways to do that and this um, particular amendment does suggest some language in the preamble and also uh, solicits, solicits additional comments in, uh, from the public in terms of uh, how they might recommend if we should incorporate an ex ante retrospective review plan and uh, if so, how to do so. With that, I'll uh, yield any questions. Is there a second for Commissioner Mohorovic's amendment? Second. Having heard a second, we'll now turn to discussion. I'll start with the first five minutes. Uh, I do want to commend the Commissioner for this and speaking of the spirit of compromise, I know that your office and Mr. Gentine in particular on your behalf 
really uh, bent over backwards to try to accommodate all the different offices' concerns, and that's very much appreciated. When we put this concept in as a possibility in the rule review plan that the commission approved, I think it was earlier this year, we, I think there was an expectation, or at least I had an expectation, especially since during the time that Professor Sunstein had been running OIRA, that there would probably be more activity on this particular area than there has been in the federal government. So one of the aspects that I'm curious to see if commenters will end up responding to if we approve your amendment is why hasn't there been more activity in the federal government? This has been an issue that Professor Sunstein has pushed. I believe ACUS has even written about it in the last few years. And so, uh, and may actually yield if you happen to know why there hasn't been since at the time that Professor Sunstein was at OIRA and has left, do you, if you happen to know why this hasn't been more widely adopted in the federal government? No, Chairman, it's a great question and um, obviously not a loaded one. And just to, to share in the, in the questions too, I've been, uh, my staff also uh, have been actively looking at all the academic materials, et cetera. Uh, there are some, um, some horizontal views of the, of the federal government in terms of the ex post retrospective reviews and some examples of best practices. Uh, I think OIRA does uh, a nice job of trying to uh, identify and highlight the great successes. But in terms of that ex-ante retrospective review, uh, there aren't a tremendous amount of, of examples uh, for us to look at. So I think our permissive language in our commission policy I think is appropriate. And this amendment as well does not suggest that it's a must. I'm obviously a strong proponent of it, uh, but it's soliciting whether or not this would be a good candidate for it given the very technical na nature of this particular rule. So I hope we get some feedback from it, but sorry for not understanding more. Yeah, definitely. And one of the areas that I'm most interested in, both in terms of the request for comments that we just approved as part of the manager's amendment, but also in relation to this, is whether or not we should have some mechanism in the rule as we go final that would push as technology increases and it becomes more feasible to lower the CO levels even more, should we have some mechanism built in to modify the rule to address the hazard even further? Because even the staff packages acknowledge, the staff package acknowledges that this rule, if adopted by the commission in final form, I think we'll get to about 50% is projected about 50% of the deaths and, deaths and injuries, and I hope we can do better at some point as techno technology allows. Commissioner Adler. Thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Mohorovic's work, uh, and I particularly want to thank his special assistant, Mike uh, Gentine, who's been incredibly helpful in explaining things to me. Uh, the only observation I would make is that retrospective rule review has been something we have done at the Commission for many years. In part, we're legally obligated to do that by the Regulatory Flexibility Act, but also we've tried to follow executive orders uh, which call for retrospective rule review. And the thing that I've, I appreciate about uh, Commissioner Mohorovic's approach is that it doesn't ex ante point us in one particular direction. Uh, I think in past years the debate has been uh, with respect to narrowing or withdrawing rules, and that's a perfectly appropriate thing to do. Rules can go stale. But in other, in other occasions, we may need to modify something, we may need to streamline it, we may need to expand it, or in some cases we may need to withdraw it. We have a rule on our books right now that uh, uh, is uh, 63 years old. That's a general wearing apparel standard, and someday I hope we can take a look at that. Uh, that said, I greatly appreciate Commissioner Mohorovic's uh, initiative, and I plan to support it. Commissioner Robinson. Earlier this year in uh, April, we voted unanimously to um, pass our plan for retrospective review of existing rules. And this plan um, consistent, was consistent with Executive Orders 13579, 13563, and 13610. And as Commissioner Adler just said, we have tried to comply with the executive orders, even though as an independent agency we are not compelled to do so. Um, the plan that we approved in April had, outlines the process and criteria for determining which rules are to be considered for review and includes an opportunity for stakeholders to weigh in on what rules they think we should review through our agenda and priorities hearing. The prioritization process is systematic and it involves staff across directorates, including subject matter experts who will review the data and information, 
provided from a range of sources to identify which of the rules we should consider for review. And while retrospective review may be included as provisions in new rulemakings, the agency considers retrospective review when developing our operating plan and our performance budget. I am going to support this um, amendment as worded, and I appreciate Commissioner Mohorovic and um, his staff's uh, uh, flexibility and putting this into language that I think is appropriate to put into the rule itself. Um, in this case, what we're really asking for in the amendment is for public comment first on the appropriateness of including retrospective rule review in this NPR. And then if we, if we put it into uh, this rule, what criteria we should use for determining the need for rule review. When Commissioner Mohorovic first came in to me with this, um, uh, I said, well, it's hard to imagine that we're going to look at this and then, uh, you know, 10 years from now say, okay, never mind, go, have at it, go ahead and emit um, carbon monoxide again. But obviously there are many more purposes to a retrospective rule review than this. And gathering this data makes sense, and I'm sure that um, it will help staff in putting together our final rule in terms of what we should do by way of, of review going forward. So I will support this. Thank you. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I also will be supporting this amendment, and I want to uh, thank Commissioner Morovic's office, Mike Gentine, as well as my staff and all of the uh, commission staff who have worked hard on this amendment as well as the others. Um, especially with me not there, they have had to do a lot of telegraphing and uh, additional emails, and so again, I want to thank them. Um, I, I do think it is good governance to ensure uh, that the rules we promulgate are effective in addressing hazards, and retrospective review is, is a part of that. And um, I do have some concerns about the reason for retrospective review, and not only is it to see if we can uh, tap into additional and improved technology, but also it is to see whether or not that standard or that rule, I should say, is um, is actually uh, advancing the cause of safety and if we're doing it in a prudent way uh, and it couldn't be done any other way. So uh, I look forward to supporting this amendment and again, thank you to all the staff for your work on this. Commissioner Mohorovic. Well, thank you. I want to thank, again, all my commissioners for their input into the, uh, the final language. I think it's uh, uh, the comments that were just um, represented by my colleagues are, are smart ones. And we should think about retrospective review and ex ante in particular as really getting to uh, the optimism that we have for this rule. I will expect that this commission will uh, vote to approve an NPR here in a matter of moments, and uh, I'm very enthusiastic about this rule. I have very high expectations, and I think the Commission has high expectations. And for those reasons, um, I think, uh, and I appreciate Commissioner uh, Adler men mentioning the Reg Flex Act. Some of them have horizons 10 years out and really far out. I think, you know, with this particular rule, uh, we're really expecting to see uh, if, in fact, it goes into effect. Uh, the benefits, the welfare, the safety benefits in the very short term. So uh, we do the best we can to come up with performance standards, but uh, the, the purpose of the ex ante retrospective review is to make sure that it's achieving uh, the goals uh, for, uh, for the public that, that we hope that they do. So with that, thank you all for your, for your input, and uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Mohorovic. Hearing no further comments on the amendment, we'll now call the vote. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Robinson? Aye. Commissioner Burkle? No. Commissioner Mohorovic? Aye. And I vote aye. The yeas are four, the nays zero. I just want to ask Commissioner Burkle, just, this is on the Mohorovic amendment. Oh, I am very sorry. Okay, I'll ask again, Commissioner Burkle, how do you vote on the Mohorovic amendment? Commissioner Burkle, are you still on the line? Yes, I am. Hi, oh. Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Now the uh, a, the yeas are five, nay zero. The Mohorovic amendment has been adopted. <laughs> <laughs> are there any more amendments or Somehow motions? I think we know Commissioner Burkle's vote on the next round. <laughs> <laughs> I think she did telegraph that. 
Uh, having heard no further amendments or motions, we'll now turn to the final vote. Uh, any further comment on the underlying package as amended before, amended before we vote on it? Commissioner Adler. Uh, no further comments. Thank Mr. you. Robinson. No. Commissioner Burkle. No further comments? No, thank you. Commissioner Mohorovic. Okay. Having heard no further comments, we will now vote on the staff package as amended. Commissioner Adler, how do you vote? Aye. Commissioner Robinson. Aye. Commissioner Burkle. We'll come back to you. Commissioner Mohorovic. No, I apologize. Okay. I'm having trouble with this phone. That's okay. I'm a no vote. Thank okay. you. Okay. Commissioner Mohorovic. Aye. And I vote aye. The yeas are four. The nays is one. The staff package as amendment as amended has been approved. Congratulations to the staff. We'll now turn to closing statements and we'll have up to 10 minutes. I do want to really thank the generator team for your diligence and your fantastic work. I think you've made, you've really set the standard and you're going to make a real difference should we go final with this rule. And even the step that we've taken today is going to change industry perceptions. It's going to change consumer expectations about what these machines should do and what they shouldn't do. And so it's been a, it's a tremendous effort and I hope you're really proud of what you've done. I certainly am very proud and I know the commissioners are too. From the proof of concept work that began with the University of Alabama, the modeling experiments at NIST, and the heavy engagement with the voluntary standards bodies and other stakeholders, CPSC staff has really delved into the details and produced an incredible path forward on safety. Of course, this is a notice to propose rulemaking. It's not a final rule. And as we mentioned in earlier comments, we are soliciting additional information on key concepts related to this rule. So there's a lot of work to do before we get to a final rule. Staff will definitely continue to engage with stakeholders, and I do want to reiterate that. As voluntary standards work continues, staff will be at the table as a very willing and able participant. I do want to express my appreciation to my fellow commissioners. I think this has been an excellent example at the commission level of compromise, and maybe everyone didn't get what they want, but I think we can all feel very proud of the additions to the package and how it's moving forward. I do also want to thank your staffs because they obviously do the hard work behind the scenes in making sure that everything gets negotiated out and I want to thank Jacqueline Campbell in particular from my staff for all the work that she's done. In closing, I do want to just reiterate one more time how proud I am and especially to Janet Beyer. Uh, Janet Beyer and Jay Howell who's no longer with the commission and I did a lot of traveling in 2013 to a number of different manufacturers across the country to try to learn more about what they were doing and to urge them to try to step up and help solve this problem and many of them have taken that to heart and are moving forward with solutions. This is a tremendous advancement for safety as I mentioned by the CPSC and it's something that I'm sure that we'll continue to champion for many years as we address this, the deaths and injuries from this hazard uh, that, we, that is just happening too much in America, especially during storms and other power outages, but it's a solvable problem and we're taking a major step forward today. Thank you. Commissioner Adler. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to join in congratulating staff on a job superbly done. Uh, I said last week that I think this stands as the platinum standard for drafting work, and I can't thank uh, uh, Janet Beyer and all of her team for the superb work that they've done. I think this shows that a tiny agency can do big things. This is an exceptionally hazardous product when not used properly, uh, and uh, as my colleague Commissioner Mohorovic has pointed out, this is pretty much a hidden hazard. People really don't anticipate just how much CO is emitted when they've got a portable generator operating, and this ought to dramatically reduce the amount of CO that is issued. So again, I want to thank all of my colleagues, and I want to thank uh, the uh, CPSC staff, and I want to particularly thank my own staff, uh, Sarah Klein and Jen Feinberg, for the excellent work they've done. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. I also want to add my thanks once again to the staff and to Ms. Byer and Ms. Middle, Little particularly for the outstanding work. Years of hard work and collaboration has gone into this package across directorates and I could not be more pleased to have voted for this NPR 
it's just a superb um, package, and I thank you so much for your hard work on this. It's important to note that the completion of this NPR for portable generators was an onerous task because it had to meet both the requirements of the APA and the requirements that we uniquely have under Section 7 and 9. Uh, of the Consumer Product Safety Act, and I particularly would like to thank the staff of, of their, our economics uh, department for their hard work on, on meeting the requirements that were required of both the APA and Section 7 and 9 in um, coming up with this package. It was extremely um, hard work, and it was excellent work. Um, as an agency, we know all too well the hazards posed by portable generators and the resulting carbon monoxide poisoning. Our efforts to address this hazard have spanned a decade, which I don't need to tell anyone in this room. Um, CPSC spent years working with the voluntary standards committees trying to ensure that robust performance standards would be put in place that would make portable generators safer, but the voluntary standards remain completely insufficient. We've been working with UL since 2002 when the first standards technical panel was formed to address portable generators, and we've worked with PGMA since they were formed in 2009. Despite dozens of meetings, technical summits, and meetings with manufacturers and industry reps, neither standard addresses carbon monoxide emissions. And staff is not aware of any manufacturer that even complies with either the UL or the PGMA standard as they are. With some exceptions, as the chairman has pointed out, industry um, has generally refused to address lowering carbon monoxide emissions even after they, made, they were made aware of technologically feasible ways that they could do so. The CPSC has dedicated an enormous amount of time and resources through our communications department on targeted education and outreach efforts on the proper use of portable generators and the importance of installing carbon monoxide detectors in the home, and yet we continue to see tragic incidents resulting in death or serious injuries. We've made some progress, including the passing of a mandatory labeling standard, and have seen a rise in the number of consumers who have installed carbon monoxide detectors in the homes, but the data are simply not reassuring. From 2004 to 2014, there have been at least 751 generator-related carbon monoxide deaths, and we have no doubt that this is an under-reporting um, number. For each of these deaths, our staff estimates there are 39 generator-related injuries, some of them extremely debilitating. These are grim numbers, and the data clearly show that mandatory labels and education alone are simply not enough. And it's because of this incident data that in 2006 the CPSC issued the ANPR, and today it is with relief that I vote to issue this NPR. In the proposed rule, the staff is focused on addressing the main hazard posed by portable generators, that is the emission of carbon monoxide. Staff's approach appropriately was to design out this hazard. As a result of CPSC's rulemaking requirements, staff not only had to identify the best and least burdensome way to address the hazard, but they also had to consider alternative solutions and justify why and they were, did so convincingly. And one of the alternatives that was considered and appropriately, I think, rejected was the automatic shutoff strategy. St staff studied four types of auto shutoff systems and identified a number of issues with the shutoff concept, including reliability and durability of these systems. And after, after performing a series of tests, staff determined that the shutoff concept without reduced carbon monoxide emissions was not technologically feasible nor effective in reducing the hazard. What is technologically feasible at this time, however, is staff's proposed performance standard that sets a maximum carbon monoxide emission rate for these poor four categories of portable generators. And this proposed performance Stanley, standard directly addresses the hazard of carbon monoxide emissions. The proposal to set a safety standard limiting emissions of carbon monoxide in portable generators is, of course, not prescriptive in terms of requiring a specific technological solution, but instead sets out performance requirements which have been proven to be attainable using currently available technology. And I'm very optimistic that with, with this performance standard, we will inspire new technologies and innovation in the field and may even be able to improve 
uh, the standard further. As we're in this NPR stage of the process, I'm eager to receive comments on the proposed rulemaking. This is the next step in the longer journey to reduce injuries and deaths from portable generators and the resulting carbon monoxide poisoning. I want to thank uh, my fellow commissioners for working together on the proposed amendment, both um, the rule review amendment and the manager's amendment, which I um, strongly support. And I would like to address um, in the a comment that Commissioner Burkle made in the fiscal year uh, 17 operating plan hearing, where she raised concerns about the CPSC issuing a mandatory standard for portable generators that included a performance test that evaluates carbon monoxide um, in emissions and her reasoning was that the EPA and not the CPSC has the authority to regulate com ca carbon monoxide emissions. I firmly disagree with Commissioner Burkle's understanding of this issue. After reviewing all of the materials including statutory and case law and looking at how operationally the EPA and the CPSC regulate entities and various products, I'm confident that the CPSC has the authority jurisdiction and obligation to regulate the four categories of portable generators addressed in this NPR and to utilize a performance requirement that includes measuring carbon monoxide emission in furtherance of our public health and safety mission. Even if a product is re regulated under EPA's Clean Air Act, the CPSC ret retains its authority to regulate if the existing regulations are not sufficient to protect consumers. The Clean Air Act regulates predominantly at the regional level and was originally passed in response to poor air quality and was meant to address issues like smog and later amended to address acid rain. In theory, one of the goals of the Clean Air Act was to protect health, which it has done. Air quality has improved since the Clean Air Act was passed, but again, that regulation focused more on ambient air quality and chronic health conditions and not the acute health risks like carbon monoxide poisoning from portable generation, generators, which we are addressing as the CPSC in this NPR. I would also like to briefly comment on a letter received by, sent to CPSC from the Portable Generators Manufacturers Association, PGMA. The letter urged us to delay rulemaking because PGMA has decided finally to reopen their standard and at long last, after years of resistance, apparently try to address the need to lower carbon monoxide emissions. While I'm always supportive of voluntary standards efforts, there is nothing in PGA, PGMA's conduct since its inception that provides any reason to delay voting on this NPR. I met with PGMA about a year ago in October 2015 after having been briefed by our staff and Ms. Byer in particular on the work we and others were doing that was so exciting in significantly reducing carbon monoxide emissions in portable generators. I was hoping that PGMA representatives would come in and discuss the efforts its members were making in the same direction since this is the only real way to address this danger, design out the hazard. I appreciated that this would require a significant investment, monetary investment from industry, but given that low carbon monoxide technology is available, combined with the horrific statistics on poisonings in this country, I was hopeful. Instead, I was presented with one focus only of, its, of PGMA's efforts, and that was labeling and education. This is certainly one solution that would cost industry virtually nothing, but it has failed so miserably. When I asked about PGMA's efforts to lower carbon monoxide emissions, I was told essentially that they did not believe that lowering emissions in portable generators is a path forward because consumers exposed to carbon monoxide from portable generators will still die. Lower, lowering carbon monoxide emissions, they said, will only delay their death. PGMA even suggested without any facts or data to support it that reduced emissions would somehow be more dangerous because people might be more inclined to move the generator into their house. The analogies I can make to this argument in different contexts are all equally macabre and ridiculous. Suffice it to say that this argument was totally specious. A portable generator can emit up to 1,500 times the carbon monoxide than that of an idling automobile. People may start to notice early symptoms and realize carbon monoxide is getting into their living space, go to shut off the generator and be overcome. That's how overwhelming the emissions are presently. 
Having more time before one dies allows for so many possibilities that will save lives and reduce injuries from neighbors or family discovering what's going on, recognizing early symptoms and getting out of the environment, mitigating the injuries, the list goes on and on. Our data show that there were at least 25,400 medically attended carbon monoxide injuries between 2004 and 2012. People can survive and without sequelae, especially if we can lower carbon monoxide emissions. Our staff estimates that 208 of the 503 deaths that occurred from carbon monoxide poisonings between 2004 and 2012 could have been averted if low emissions generators were in place. Therefore, PGMA's position that lowering emissions will simply mean it will take people longer to die is belied by the data. In one study, the time interval required for carbon hemoglobin level to reach the benchmark representing incapacitation increased from 8 minutes to 96 minutes when using low carbon monoxide emission prototype generator in an enclosed garage. This time interval further increases for potential victims who may be in the home. This is precious time, critical time, and can mean the difference between life and death. Labeling and marketing were essentially all PGMA planned at that time, and, at, and our conversation even refused to require a longer extension cord, which would make it easier for consumers to use the generators a safe distance from the house. So I will just say to PGMA, I'm delighted that you've, you're willing to reopen the standard. I always am hopeful, because I'm an eternal optimist, that um, something will be done with the voluntary standard, but there's absolutely nothing about finally reopening this standard that should keep us from going forward with this NPR. Indeed, the rule wasn't reopened until um, PGMA knew that there was an NPR that was imminent. So our staff has committed to, and I'm sure will continue to work with industry toward a voluntary standard, and we are hopeful that we can reach it. But if not, we should go forward with this, because this is the only way we can save lives. Thank you again for your hard work. Commissioner Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I also want to thank the generator team for all of their work and the work that they will continue to do as this process plays out. Ms. Beyer, uh, you and all of your team really deserve recognition for the efforts you've put into this. Uh, as well to my staff and all of the Commission staff, thank you for the work that went into today's uh, NPR package. I'm a strong supporter of voluntary standards in lieu of mandatory government regulations whenever voluntary standards actually reduce the risk of concern. Congress enshrined this preference for voluntary standards in our statutes, and I believe it is the course we as an agency should pursue. Despite Commissioner Robinson's skepticism, the Portable Generator Manufacturers Association has advised us by letter that it has reopened the voluntary standard for portable generators to incorporate performance criteria focused on limiting carbon monoxide concentration. PGA's, PGMA's letter states that it is well along the way in developing a performance-based standard which will effectively address the hazard. We should allow the industry, and I believe Congress would agree, the time it needs to pursue a voluntary, a strong voluntary standard. Issuing the notice of proposed rulemaking at this time is only, only going to distract them from their efforts on the voluntary standard and delay the process unnecessarily. This is particularly true when the rulemaking package is as technical and as complex as this one. In addition, the comment period is only 75 days stretched over two holiday periods. Our experience with the proposed standard for recreational off-highway vehicles vividly illustrates this point. The ROV manufacturers were the ones who came up with innovative solutions to the safety challenges, and they probably would have done so more quickly if they had not been obliged to give priority to our rulemaking proposal. In the case of portable generators, there are additional reasons, I believe, to not to excuse me, there are additional reasons to support work on voluntary standards in preference to this mandatory regulation. To begin with, and I disagree wholeheartedly with Commissioner Robinson. To begin with, there are serious questions about our legal authority to regulate carbon monoxide emissions from generators. Section 31 of the CPSA clearly states, and it removes the Commission's authority to regulate a risk of injury 
if it, quote, could be eliminated or reduced to a sufficient extent by actions taken under the Clean Air, Clean Air Act, end quote. In my view, it is clear that EPA can regulate these carbon monoxide emissions under the Clean Air Act. In fact, EPA has already promulgated CO emission standards for the spark ignition engines used to power these generators. Those standards are part of a far more comprehensive regulatory scheme that is administered by the EPA. I do not believe CPSC should be disrupting that scheme without a strong showing that EPA is legally unable to continue tightening its own standards to levels that would sufficiently reduce the, the hazards of concern to us. Beyond this threshold question, there are other noteworthy problems raised by this notice proposed rulemaking. I'm particularly concerned that we are proposing regulations whose costs, by our own calculations, significantly outweigh the benefits at least for some of the generator classes. I also question why we are proposing tighter standards for smaller generators if the standards for larger generations are adequate, excuse me, generators are adequate to protect against the risk of concern. Under the Consumer Product Safety Act, before we adopt a mandatory standard, we must find that it imposes a, quote, least burdensome, end quote, requirement that adequately reduces the risk of concern. Pursuing our objectives in the voluntary standards arena would avoid all of these thorny legal issues. A consensus standard, as Congress has repeatedly instructed us to take, is the course that CPSC should take at this point. Thank you again uh, to everyone, and in particular to John McGugan for this accommodation and for uh, your assistance this morning in making my participation possible. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Burke. We continue to think of your mom and uh, are certainly talking a lot about that and uh, wishing you as well as possible under the circumstances. Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And to uh, my fellow commissioners, Commissioner Adler and Commissioner Burkle, it's a little bit lonely up here without you. Uh, so as the chairman mentioned, and I know I speak on behalf of my colleagues, that you are in our thoughts and we look forward to your, uh, to your return. Uh, thanks as well to the entire generator team especially Ms. Byer, Ms. Little, and uh, the entire team for a job very well done, and those beyond the team that contributed uh, to this notice of proposed rulemaking. I want to also thank my colleagues for supporting my amendment. Uh, I believe a culture of retrospective review is an important hallmark of a sophisticated, effective administrative state. As we all know, part of CPSC's mission is to protect the public against unreasonable risks of injury associated with consumer products. We often focus on the word protect, as we should, but we cannot lose sight of the word unreasonable. Our job is not to replace consumers' own judgment as their best protection against all risk. Our job is to facilitate that judgment by addressing unreasonable risk. We're supposed to supplement responsible decision making, not supplant it. There are some hazards that consumers fully understand and choose to encounter. Sometimes they even increase their risks by disabling safety features. Those choices are the consumers to make. Even if we would make different choices, they are not necessarily unreasonable. In the case of carbon monoxide poisoning from portable generators, I believe there is an unreasonable risk we should address. Each year, we see dozens of CO-related deaths from generator use. What I find compelling in these tragedies is not just their number, which is staggering, but also their nature. These incidents demonstrate that consumers don't fully appreciate the hazard posed by CO emission from generators. It is a latent hazard. I appreciate Commissioner Adler uh, pointing out again that that has been an emphasis of mine with this particular hazard uh, category. It is a latent hazard rather than a patent one. This hazard is addressable. There is a technological path towards less hazardous generators, and that path is reasonable. The proposed rule asks industry to do something that is well within their reach. And so we have the opportunity to meaningfully address a hazard that has resulted in hundreds of preventable deaths. We should take that opportunity. As a conservative who believes in the power of free market to correct itself, 
I am usually reluctant to support regulation. Most of the time, I believe that government intervention, however well-meaning, can create as many problems as it solves. But sometimes government is in the best position to solve a problem. I believe this is one of those times. Usually government's most appropriate role is to correct an information imbalance. When one player in a market has far more information than others, the market doesn't, op doesn't function properly. In some ways, the problem with CO from portable generators is an information imbalance. Generator manufacturers, safety experts and regulators have the specialized experience to know how serious the hazard is. Consumers do not. Certainly many consumers understand that engines, including generator engines, produce carbon monoxide. <clears throat> That's why many consumers take steps to mitigate the hazard. However, I believe many consumers do not understand just how much carbon monoxide generators produce or how quickly the hazard can emerge. That's why even some consumers who have taken steps to mitigate the hazard are included in our very sobering statistics. This size of this knowledge gap, the gap between the perception of a hazard and its reality is startling. For example, consumers understand that running a car in, clo in a closed garage is a lethal mix. Based on the number of incidents we see with generators in open garages, consumers may assume the CO hazards from cars and generators and the mitigation strategies are roughly equal. Our staff has, generated, has demonstrated just how inaccurate and how deadly that assumption is. Our staff has shown that a five kilowatt generator can produce as much CO as hundreds of cars. An open door isn't enough, and a closed one is a recipe for disaster. Our task is to help consumers close their knowledge gap. As with any gap, we can try to close it from either direction. We can give consumers more knowledge, or we can bring the hazard closer to consumers' current understanding. We are trying to close the gap. On the consumer side, we have ongoing targeted education campaigns, and we require warning labels on generators that are as clear and direct as any label I've seen. Unfortunately, though, the incidents remain pretty consistent. In closing the gap from the education side isn't working, we have to explore closing it from the hazard side. We have to look for a solution that will address the hazard with as little market disruption as possible. This package demonstrated, demonstrates that we have at least one viable way to address the hazard of portable generator CO emissions through the use of existing technology. We can reduce generators emissions, emissions to a level that is closer to consumers' expectations. Moreover, off-the-shelf proven technology is available at costs that I believe the market can reasonably bear. Our statutes tell us to prefer performance standards to design mandates, and this proposal is a performance standard. Right now, there might be only one technological game in town, but it doesn't have to stay that way. I believe in the power of American innovation, and I would not be at all surprised to see someone build a better, better low CO mousetrap in the near future. In the interim, even if everyone uses the same approach, at least that approach is readily available to everyone. In this proposed rule, we are not mandating a proprietary technology that would unfairly restrict access to the market. This is how CPSC regulation should function, and it's an approach I can support. In closing, one of my favorite quotes about this agency's mission comes from one of our earliest court cases. In Aquaside, Aqua Slide and Divide and Dive Corp versus CPSC, the aptly named Judge, Judge Wisdom wrote that, quote, an important predicate to commission action is that consumers be unaware of either the severity, frequency, or ways of avoiding the risk. If consumers have accurate information and choose to incur the risk, then their judgment may well be reasonable. I do not believe consumers fully appreciate either the severity of generators, CO risk, or the, ways, or the ways of avoiding the risk. I do not believe consumers' partial understanding is based on accurate information. And so I believe this risk is unreasonable and commission action is appropriate. With that, go Cubs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On that note, this concludes this public meeting of the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. Thank you.